It is my honor to welcome you today to our program, Our Politics, Our Religions, Reflecting on 2020 and Beyond. Yesterday in his inauguration speech, President Biden, in thinking about how he was approaching this moment, echoed the words of President Lincoln. I quote, my whole soul is in it. Today on this January day, my whole soul is in this, bringing America together, uniting our people, uniting our nation. And I ask every American to join me in this cause." Unquote. As an interreligious organization committed to dialogue around our differences, it is vital that we at ICJS state clearly and boldly that democratic foundations are what make our work possible. Religious pluralism thrives within a society that values different religious and ethical voices within the public square. To build an interreligious future, we will need to work together. And this requires us to bring our whole souls to it. Our voices and our vision, our hopes, our fears and our sadness, our deepest held beliefs and our sacred reasons for civic action. I wanna share an excerpt from Amanda Gorman's powerful inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb, which was recited yesterday on the Capitol steps. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in the bridges we've made. That is the promise to Glade, the hill we climb if only we dare. It's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. Democratic foundations make religious pluralism possible. So any attack on our democracy is a threat to our interreligious community. And in turn, the safeguarding of our democracy protects a shared interreligious future. As we consider the events of the past month, the past we have stepped into, and the work of repair that we must do, diverse religious imaginations will play a critical part. We must be careful observers of the diversity of American religious symbols on display and the theologies undergirding these religious expressions in our nation's capital and in our local communities. But we must not only observe, we must encourage interreligious leaders to speak in their authentic religious voices to this moment. And that is our goal here today, to have interreligious leaders who are part of the ICJS community speak about what they have observed, but also share how they engage politically as people grounded in their religious and ethical traditions. Then we invite you, as Americans committed to building an interreligious future, to do the same, to listen and learn, to speak and be heard. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alicia Tatum, ICJS Program Director for Congregational Leaders, who will lead us through today's program. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubens, for that beautiful welcome and really framing the purpose for today's event. So the staff at the ICJS is grateful that each of you have decided to be a part of this conversation as we all navigate what it means to bring our whole souls or our whole selves to the work of creating an interreligious future. We are very excited about the panels that we have today. Um, they are a part of the ICJS community. And so um, they're not only a part of our community, but they're also an integral part of the Baltimore community. Um, each of them provides significant leadership in various settings. And so we're so grateful to be able to learn from them and with them. And so I'm just gonna give some brief introductions and then they'll go on and, and share from that reflection point as far as how does their religious or ethical tradition um, shape their civic engagement. And so I just wanna start by introducing Pat Shannon Jones. She is the Executive Director of Immigration Outreach Service Center of Baltimore. Um, she's a regular program participant at the ICJS and she's a current Congregational Leaders Fellowship participant. So we're glad to have her here with us. And then we also have Scott Adams. He's the pastor of Heritage United Church of Christ and the assistant director of Interfaith and Ecumenical Ministries at Loyola University. And he's also an ICJS Justice Leaders Fellowship alum. 
We're glad to have him here with us. And then we also have a, a former teacher fellow, Josh Headley. He is the current history department chair and gifted and advanced learning liaison at the Baltimore Polytechnic um, Institute. And as an educator, Josh strives to create a welcoming environment for his students where they feel comfortable asking and discussing difficult questions that often don't have a definite answer. And so we look forward to hearing more from Josh. And then we also have Tracy Guidecker. Um, she's a native Baltimorean. She is a senior partner at Joyous Justice, where she is the co-creator and co-host of the podcast, Jews Talk Racial Justice with April and Tracy. And she's also the mind behind BeMoreIncremental.com. And Tracy is also a Justice Leaders Fellowship um, alumna. So we're glad to have her with us as well. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Terrell Williams with us, um, who also was a former, a former justice leader. And he currently serves as an associate organizer with BUILD. And he's the co-director of Turnaround Tuesday, which is a jobs movement that seeks living wage employment for underemployed and returning citizens while developing civic leaders. And so I am so, so grateful to have each of you here as our panelists and also as facilitators. And so I'm gonna actually turn it over to you all and I'll have Pat share and then we can go on with Scott and Josh, then Tracy and then Terrell. Thank you so much, Alicia. It's such a pleasure to be here and to reconnect with quite a number of people here, uh, in particular, Mr. Terrell, good to see you. Um, and it's a pleasure to, uh, to have been asked to participate in this. I have to tell you, since we first started discussing this, I have written and rewritten my thoughts several times just because of the chaos and difficulties that we've endured over the last month. So how does my religious and or ethical tradition shape my political decisions and civic engagement? My short answer, we were all captivated by Amanda Gorman's words yesterday. My short answer is being American is the past we step into and how we repair it. So let me start with my past. I'm a child of the 60s and don't start doing the math, okay? But I am, I'm a child of the 60s. I was raised in a Catholic family, attended a small private school, all white. My father was a decorated non-commissioned officer. He fought for his country. I fought against the Vietnam War and against colonial power. It was an interesting home life. Um, I thought I lived in a fractured world, a fractured and rudderless country back then. And I now know that I was right, but now the fractures are more visible. So let me just add that I've done a lot of global work. Um, I've interfaced with and gotten to know and love traditions and cultures from around the globe, including faiths um, like the Jewish faith. I worked in Israel. Um, the Buddhist uh, tradition, I worked in Nepal, uh, the Hindu tradition and other Christian traditions. So it's been quite a journey for me. In terms of my studies, I studied at uh, a small school I mentioned um, for high school. And of course, that's the important question in Baltimore. So I'll just say Maryvale. I went to Notre Dame of Maryland University to Loyola and also to St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute. So now as we step into the more recent past, November of 2016, that would be November 9th, 2016, the results of the election were announced and I knew we were in a fractured and rudderless country. I knew that my immigration work was going to face extreme uh, danger, if you will. And from 2017 on, we saw countless executive actions that split us all into factions and it was for or against, it was hate or approval. And then George Floyd and Breonna Taylor happened. We had to say the names that Black Lives Matter, not the constitutional version, which I call 0 0.6, but the Black Lives Matter version that we need today, 1.0. So for me, we are a fractured and rudderless country. So then we moved to 
2020 and the calls of voter fraud in November. Um, January 6th, again, calls of voter fraud, anger, hate, incitement to riot, premeditated insurrection, and the fractures just seem to split apart and seem more obvious to me and the rudderless sense of who we are. So as a child of the 60s, let me just jump back to that. I was given a gift, and this is where my ethical and spiritual background comes in. I lived in a family of introverts who sat at the dinner table every night and who listened to one another. And it was through my family that I first learned contemplative listening. In 2016, I was accepted into the Living School to study with Richard Rohr. So my work in contemplation solidified my belief in nonviolence, my belief in equity, and my belief in a theology of embrace, Jesus' theology of welcoming. So this past, my past, has led me to a specific stance in life. And within this stance, um, I believe um, in my religion, of course, we can discuss that, but also the mystics and the evolutionary visionaries who speak um, to our evolution into the cosmic Christ. I believe in equity and in spite of the teachings and writings and doings of the Catholic Church, I still believe in my church. So I still believe in the very center of my soul that we are a fractured and rudder rudderless country. But my contemplative work within my faith helps me to keep my focus, my religion, my spirituality, my ethical tradition continues to lead me to nonviolence, to contemplative listening, to listening without judgment. I do believe with my heart and my soul that being American right now is the past we step into and how we repair it. And this, this stance begins to heal fractures and put the rudder back in the water. I mentioned earlier that I heard Ibram Kendi speak last night, and he said that we have joy now, but resolve tomorrow. And I bring that back because we have the joy of seeing transition, but we must have the resolve to work to make the transition a good transition and the future better. Um, so thank you very much. The question is is really something that that I've wrestled with. I'm sure as every panel panelist has. Um, but one of the things that I really approach this topic and this conversation is I enter into this space as who I am, I'm an African American man in America in a very divided time. Uh, this moment in time is uh, very acute in terms of uh, the suffering and pain that many of us have experienced. And it's very widespread in, in a way that uh, many people are aware. Um, but I do have to say that as an African-American man who uh, grew up in this country and who's watched his parents and grandparents and great grandparents deal with the oppression, this is nothing new. Uh, I, I'm reminded of what ta Coates said on January 6th during the time of the resurrection, uh, resurrection, insurrection. Uh, and he said, uh, we told you so. And, and I, I enter into that space with that sentiment. I enter into this, what I call Kairos moment, uh, which is a propitious moment for decision and action. And I come to this conversation today as an African-American man who is by vocation a preacher. And so my, my reflection uh, in this particular moment comes from the frame of to look at, uh, look at this as the soul of our nation is at stake and the subsequent redemption of that said soul. Uh, I come from a tradition of, uh, I was licensed to preach in, in the Baptist tradition in an African-American church. My grandparents uh, founded uh, a church here in Baltimore City, Zion Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. I grew up with uh, the faith and the Christian theology 
uh, that I now hold on to with everything that I have that is a part of my soul uh, as a black man in this country. And I, I perceive and, and view the world from that lens. And so when we talk about the soul of a nation, I, I, I look at it from the sense of the Christian theology that is everything to me and say America has never repented for the sins of that it has committed against humanity, for the sins that it has committed against the colonization of the land and the brutalization of the indigenous sisters and brothers who inhabited this land before they came. America has never repented for the sins of uh, enslavement of black bodies and the diaspora of stealing black bodies from the land and then enslaving them and still uh, are subject to a slaveholding society in 2021. Um, it's just slavery by another name. Mm -hmm. For repentance in its fullest sense from a Christian context is a complete change of orientation. That's never happened. Repentance is a transformation, not reformation. We've seen reformation, which is labeled as progress, but reformation is merely uh, a reiteration of what already is. And, 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 and repentance involves the, the actual reorientation or transformation, and it involves the subsequent judgment upon our past and looking at it through a critical analysis of the truth and then a deliberate and intentional redirection towards our future. And that's why making America great again, you know, the good old days is an ideology that is diametrically opposed to one of the foundational principles of Christian faith and theology, that is repentance. Just as voter suppression and intimidation, just as policy and legislation that punishes the impoverished just as high crimes and misdemeanors and now insurrection against the capital erroneously labeled as positive polarization is diametrically opposed to democracy. And so political advocacy framed in this faith context of this congregation of this conversation tonight is grounded in what I call the prophetic witness of the church. It has to be grounded in the prophetic witness of the church by the called out ones, the ecclesia who are called to resist the powers that preserve privilege and perpetuate persecution. Just as the prophet we just celebrated, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King asserted, the church must be reminded that it is not the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. King declared that if the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. So political advocacy today, as it meant yesterday, means speaking out prophetically against evil, speaking out against policies and practices that the prophet Isaiah spoke of in Isaiah 10 in our Hebrew text that is so valuable to the Christian theological faith. What sorrow awaits the unjust judges and those who issue unfair laws. They provide or deprive the poor of justice and deny the rights of the needy, needy among my people. They prey on widows and take advantage of the orphans. Not just in forums then such as these do we speak out against the evil, but at your dining room table then is where we speak out. In our Zoom rooms, at our, at our jobs, when we're having conversations about budgets and our calendar events for the upcoming year is when we speak out against evil. Even when the context of the conversation has nothing to do with justice on the surface, it always has to do with justice. So political advocacy means more than just tweets and pictures and saying things on social media that black lives matter. It means advocating for a reorientation or transformation of systems and structures that we engage in every day and relentlessly speaking out against the evils that if black life truly matters, then we're going to fight like hell to stop the hell that black life is having to endure each and every day. For as the statement that has been attributed to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a theologian who was, uh, who was uh, executed in concentration camps, he says, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. God, and not to speak, 
is to speak is is not to speak is to speak and and not to act is to act thank you my name is josh headley um i am a white anglo-saxon protestant that's right i'm an actual wasp um we do exist and it's kind of nuts because i was raised presbyterian and as a presbyterian if you are um if you've got the parents that I did, they were actively engaged in the church. That was their social institution. So that meant that mom was um, taking care of the choir, leading that and helping out with the youth club on, on Wednesdays where you know we'd wrap up with everyone up in the fellowship hall and a hot meal and it was fresh dessert every night. It was awesome. And you know, dad was a deacon. So he served on the, on the uh, congregational session. And I grew up with the concept that there was a governmental structure that was simply a part of what society should be and that there's a purpose for the rules that we follow the fact that these are the the rules and beliefs that they are the foundations of our faith that allow us to boldly weather the storms of life um so i went off to college up in alaska and which was a former presbyterian mission school and encountered all the the native religions in the various indigenous groups in alaska and realized just how deprived i was for exposure to everything else um, because if there's one thing that we did really well in the Presbyterian church, <laughs> we learned the Presbyterian church and nothing else. Um, so I, I went up and learned a whole bunch and realized how ignorant of life I really was, came back and married Lutheran. And let me tell you, the difference in theology was amazing. So first they said, hey, we need you to actually learn about the church. Like, sweet, cool. What does that mean? I said, we don't know, but there's a class that you're going to have to take, and we're going to have coffee and, and cookies. Sweet coffee, cookies. I am there. But the one thing that I noticed as we were showing up every Sunday and before I got involved in the church is that like many Presbyterian and Lutheran churches, um, my wife and I were the youngest members by about 20 years, which meant that on a regular basis, we would have announcements of this member has entered the church triumphant and then this member had entered the church triumphant and for the life of me i had no idea what this was like what's this church triumphant is this some you know victory goalpost dance is this a, a victory lap or something and that's when i really started digging into the concept of the church militant and the church triumphant um because i do teach um I've taught in public schools my entire career, about 25 years, and I've been in Baltimore City now for 21 of those 25. Um, I live in the church militant. I live in a way that I am constantly working against the forces of ignorance, uh, the forces of evil, the forces of essentially the seven deadly sins that that are proclaimed in the uh, in the in the Old Testament. Um, I'm constantly working against those. But I'm working against those in a way that I'm trying my best to be the good in the world for my students so that they have a chance to then be the good for someone else and we can spread it that way. Um, I'm completely unapologetic when kids ask me about my faith and based on, on what we talk about in class, they're like, you go to church, Mr. Headley? Like, yes, yes, I do. Like, and you sing in the choir? Yes, yes, I do. But you say such things. like. Yes, yes, I do. Now let's go. Um, so that's my that's my brief intro. Um, whoever's in my group, we're gonna have some fun discussing things. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tracy Guy Decker. I use she, her pronouns. I am Jewish. I was raised in a reform tradition with very little Jewish education um, and um, and learn, but learned a lot as an adult and my faith has become and my my commitments my religious commitments have become extremely important to me um and um like pat prepping for this um has been a act of revision and revision and revision um so because I, I could talk about this for a lot more than three minutes um <laughs> i I think if I have to sum it up to just one religious idea that drives pretty much everything else, it is Betzalem Elohim, in the image of God. 
um, we're taught that humans were made in the image of God. And my rabbi tells me that sometimes I'll, I'll say like, wow, that was an amazing sermon. That was an amazing piece of Torah. And she'll say, you know what, that one, I wrote that one because it's the one I needed to hear. And that's, that's kind of what the importance of B'Tselem Elohim is for me, because at its core, if we fundamentally internalize and embrace the idea that each of us reflects the divine, then our productivity is not our worth. Our wealth is not our worth. Our language, none of the things that we put status on in society are actually our worth. Our worth is fundamentally just the fact that we exist as human beings created in the image of the divine. As a recovering perfectionist, I struggle with this. I struggle with that idea that I have inherent worth, even if I took a nap today, even if I didn't do the laundry, even if there's a stack of dishes. I really, really struggle with that. And so I think that the wisdom of my rabbi, the, the sermons that most resonate for me are the ones that she wrote because she needed to hear them. And so that's part of what this um, importance of B'Tselem Elohim, I think, is for me. And it is exactly... Um, I think what drives the anti-racist education because the structures that we have built, the anti-racist education and work to dismantle white supremacy because at its core, white supremacy is an idolatry that suggests that we are not all made in the image of the divine, but the white people are and people with darker skin are not. And so it is, it is an idolatry. And I think that's my, in my last five seconds, that's my reflections on the past couple of weeks and months and years is that we have been suffering under a form of idolatry where we have replaced what we are meant to worship with some other idol, i.e. whiteness in this case. Um, I have a lot more to say, so I look forward to being in conversation with some of you later. First, I want to say uh, thank you to Dr. Tatum. And uh, I am my best when I'm around people. And so, you know, I'm not too good these days. Um, I, I, but I can say that I want to go sort of backwards and say January 6th was one of the happiest days of my life. I love the truth. There is nothing about, nothing like the truth. And for me, I want to spend the first few minutes just telling you a little bit about my enraged journey and to becoming um, a co-founder of Turnaround Tuesday, which I think is God's gift to me for all the hard things that I've done to become an instrument to really be used by God to do the things that he has called on each and every single one of us to do. And many of the questions that we were given are very easy for me to answer because I can't separate my Christianity uh, from my being. I can't do it. It is, it is nearly impossible. So it's impossible for me to intentionally hurt or see someone hurt without acting. The question is, how do I act? It's never a question of whether I should act. And so I am from St. Louis, Missouri. I grew up in a very, 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 very violent neighborhood called Cochrane Gardens which was literally less than a mile from the arch. So I could see my bedroom every single day from probably the poorest piece of land in St. Louis and look at the richest piece of land. And I can tell you that even at the age of six, I realized that something was terribly wrong. Uh, I went to a school that looked pretty much like this 25 story building that I lived in. And I can say to you, there are many days this six, seven-year-old would go home at three o'clock, touch the metal on the big heavy door and release it. And I would run down the street about two blocks away where there was a six-story building, all glass, absolutely beautiful. And I know for sure it wasn't called anything around gardens, but it had a lot of flowers. And I saw that the elevator worked because I never understood why mine didn't. And I realized that I didn't belong in that building. And I just didn't know why because no one who went in that building looked like me. 
And I could not understand. Um, and, and, and that anger around that would, would soon turn to rage as I continued, you know, six years old, seven years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. And, and I expected, I believed in this thing called democracy. I believed, I believed that it was for everybody. I mean, based on what I read, and, and, and I could somewhat read. They did teach me somewhat how to read. Uh, but I, I would ask my half, my, my grandmother, who's half white and half black, I mean, about as close to white as, as I had ever seen before I was 15. And she knew how I suffered through the years with this very, very dark skin, not from just white people, from, but from all people. I mean, I got ridiculed every day. I mean, I had to re be repaired every day. And my grandmother knew this. And she would say many, many things to me. And one of the things that she said to me that I'll always remember is, uh, you have always been who you are. And I didn't understand what that mean, be, meant because I, I, I always saw myself as something outside of human. And, 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 and I couldn't name it. I couldn't describe it. I just knew I didn't fit. And so I would go to school every single day from sixth grade uh, until I graduated from high school. And when I say every day, I got perfect attendance from sixth grade until I graduated from high school. And I went off in this great scholarship to KU and plunked out in the first semester. I was doomed. I had gone to school with $35 in a book bag. And I went two months early because I could not stand poverty any longer. I just could not do it. I could not see my mother um, in her many states and uh, my brothers and sisters and you know, my extended family around me where no one had grad gone to college and no one had graduated. And many of them were smart and intelligent. I mean, people that I really believed in, four of them would go off uh, to the war, uh, to the Vietnam War and come back really, really hurt. Uh, but I still believed, you know, and I thought all of these things was something that was wrong with me. And I become more and more angry and I become more and more enraged. And, and as I would flunk out of one college and then another, I'd gone to seven different college, colleges before I got the intervention that I really need. And it, it would come from a little woman at Prince George's Community College where I said to, to my friend who took me over to the school because he got tired of me talking about, I'm going back, I'm gonna get my degree, I'm gonna get my degree. Because my grandmother told me at the age of seven, that's the only way that you're gonna get out of this poverty. You've got to have a great talent, and I wasn't a great football player. Or, or you got to you got to use that wisdom that you have, and you got to maximize it. But it wasn't working for me. I would end up homeless in Chicago. I mean, all kinds of things would happen. I would end up joining the military. I would end up I, I, I would join the Marine Corps, and it was the wrong thing for me. And so I would get, and with each one of these things, I would become more and more enraged. I mean, I can tell you stories whenever I felt like someone didn't value me, didn't open the door like they opened the door for the white person, or didn't serve me like they served the white person that was sitting next to me in the cafeteria. I would absolutely explode. And I will tell you in the different places it would take me, not to mention a few times that I've been jailed for it. Um, I was absolutely out of line. And, and, and the day that I went to Prince George's Community College, I thought, that I would be rescued. I was 38 years old. And I, I, I took the entrance exam and the, the lady said to me, you need to take a remedial math class, you need to take a remedial language arts class, and you need to take a, a re remedial uh, writing class. And I turned to my friends like, they're just trying to take my money. I'm not doing that, I'm smart. I graduated number 27 out of 659, what do you mean? And that lady turned around who could have been probably 80, 85 years old, little bitty black woman, weighed about 70 pounds soaking wet. She said, who was your competition, sir? Broke me in half. I took those classes. I got, uh, I got, um, got my associates with, uh, and then I got um, a scholarship to UB, which landed me here in Baltimore, to UB. And then I got a scholarship to the College of, College of Notre Dame, and then a post-certification master's. And now I'm off, of, off to a, a doctorate. What am I saying? What, am I, what I'm saying is this. We cannot be Christian and watch systems kill people. 
they just don't go together. And it doesn't matter what the person looks like. I remember in being an organizer two years ago, I was really challenged. Hopkins was looking to build a police force. And it caused so many problems with so many people. And the president came to me, well, to our organization. He said, will you support us? And we had many, many conversations with Hopkins, including the president. And I remember one conversation I had with him, particularly where I said to him, you have to understand my, persist, my position as an African-American because I'm a brother that cannot drive down the street and see a police officer behind me without feeling a sense of nervousness, although I have nothing, no blemishes on my record at all. I am extremely nervous when there's a police car behind me at the age of 58. I want you to understand if I give my word to you all getting the police department, it must be a model department, it must be constitutional policing, and understand the first time that you are challenged around shooting or hurting or maiming another individual without accountability, we will be the first group in your face. And I can tell you after I spoke at the General Assembly, I took a lot of flack, a lot of flack, especially from African Americans. Because see, what I understand is this, if we're gonna build the world as it should be, we gotta look at America holistically. And so I cannot point out Johns Hopkins for being so unfair and racist against African Americans because most institutions were and are. And so I cannot say that to an, uh, uh, an institution, you can't protect yourself because I have a burglar alarm and a dog to protect myself. And so we have to understand that there's one thing uh, around racism, there's another thing around safety, and Johns Hopkins should have the right to protect itself. But it does not have the right to treat people differently. And they are different. And so what I'm, on, what I'm exploring today in my own life is how much more, <laughs> how much more pain does God have in store for me? Because I realize every single thing that I have suffered for, God has used to help other people. And for the first time in my entire life, I have worked harder than I've ever worked, and I get more joy than I've ever gotten because I know that I may not make a lot of money for, I do, for what I do, but I know that I'm, I'm, I'm in God's purpose. I know I am doing what God wants me to do because I am using what he is giving me to connect to another individual. And I will always stand for truth, even when it's most uncomfortable, even if, when it's people who look like me. I feel like we have to be warriors. We have to be objective warriors. And it, it has to be based on our true love for humanity. And if you don't have a true love for humanity, if the person has to look like you in order for you to speak up, then I question your Christianity. And I have no right to do that. Thank you. I just wanted to give each of you a chance for the next 10 minutes or so to reflect together um, and what I, what I wanted to do is just ask, put a question out there. So we heard from Heather, um, Amanda Gorman's phrase in her poem, pass we stop into and how we repair it. So she blurs temporality. We moved into Pat where she talked about this fractured and, and rudderless soul that, that we inhabit as a country. Scott shared with us this need for repentance, um, that the traces of the, the violence that, that makes up every aspect of our language, our laws, our, our buildings, everything that, that we live and breathe that we call society has those vestiges and traces of that violence that we need to reorient and that we need to repent. And then Josh, in both of that spirit, wants to stand up and practice virtue. Not virtue as an end, but a means in itself that, that virtue needs to be modeled and lived in recognizing those, those fractures and, and 
that implicit violence. And then Tracy talked about whiteness as a, as a form of idolatry and a commitment to whiteness as idolatrous ways. And that, that the image of God is embedded in each person as they, they go through life. And that tshuva, this return, this repair is to see that image, even if, if there are things that are blocking us to see that image. And then Terrell has a deep appreciation for truth with a capital T. That suffering is something that, that is real and suffering is something we lean into and that even a political reality that causes shock and unrest should be engaged as that implicit violence that Scott was referring to coming up for all of us to experience together, that we can't look away, that this is an opportunity for repentance and truth. And so I feel that, and I, I think that these are very powerful statements um, and so what I want to put out there for, for all of you is how do we do that? How do we do that work of repair um, at a time in which people inhabit these different truths who don't see the violence, who don't want to see it, who in fact will go out of their way to, to live beyond that truth. And yet we somehow theologically have to see some sort of divine image in those who, who reject that um, reality and refuse to repent. And so in our last 10 minutes together, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on how we, we can do that. We started off talking about like the first question and whatnot, but then we got to truth and trust. And how do we talk truth to one another if we have no place to start? And what we found ourselves doing, and I don't think we did it intentionally, I think maybe Benjamin got us started, I don't remember, but we started telling our stories. And as we told our stories, we knew that was our truth. And from that, we could move into other things. Um, and we, all of us are either rooted in the faith that on the edges of the faith where we grew up, where we've migrated to other denominations. And so that wasn't our truth. And what it came down to was who are you and what do you look for to find trust? And we found it in just kind of describing how we work in groups, how we begin, how we tell our story and, and how we can then from our stories honor one another. And I think the best part of it all was Benjamin served in Vietnam and I had to back up and explain that although that was a great discussion in our family, I will always honor those who serve. And I didn't mean it to uh, demean those who served, just the reason for our people being there. And that was wonderful. And I thank Benjamin so much for sharing that because it put us at a point of saying, oh, we do agree there, absolutely. And then we began to tell our stories. So don't want to take up too much time, but I thought the storytelling piece was really helpful. Because one of the things that we were getting to in our group towards the very end is that this concept of what we have as our social construct is extremely fragile. And you know, like we're all coming from different backgrounds. And I fully realize the reason why I have my five, 600 year history of my family is because I'm a white man and it was written down and that's what I've inherited. And with that, I have to do something with it. Um, and for me on January 6th, seeing a Confederate flag flying in the Capitol when I have grandfathers who fought for Ohio in the civil war against that very symbol and everything it stood for and people say, oh, it's about states rights. Yeah, the states rights to own people, so slaves, yeah. come on. Um, so it's like, I know what it represents then. I know what it represents now. And we got to the, to the point, like this, this boiling fire that erupted in public view for everyone to see. Why are people so angry? And it, Faye had this great, great answer at the very end. People are angry because people are being lied to. And the reason why people are being lied to and why they're so angry 
is just because people are being lied to. So what we have to do, we have to teach the truth. And the truth must be known. And I'm pretty sure that goes across every possible theological platform. So I want to add um, something, which is that I think there's also something that about accountability and um, and our own integrity, because it's really easy to get polarized. And this is something that my eight-year-old daughter taught me after January 6th. So um, we were talking, she had learned about it a little bit at school, and um, we were talking about it. And she said, a lady got shot. And I said, yeah, I heard. And she said, she should have been arrested. She shouldn't have been shot. And I was like, whoa, (laughs) right from the mouths of babes, Um, which is exactly what I've been saying about Black Lives Matter (laughs) protesters. Um, And, and Sandra and Jacob Blake and, you know, Freddie Gray. And like, I've been saying that and she's been listening. Um, and so I think that was a really important reminder for me to have integrity and to apply my B'Tselem Elohim thing, even when it's hard, um, even when it's harder to see because they don't think like I do or are espousing things that I find hate- hateful, there's still some piece of God in there. So. Contrary to people thinking that, dem- I mean, I think democracy is very strong because I've been trying to break systems all my life. You know, I think uh, uh, democ- this democracy is fragile when white people go crazy, right? We talk about the fragility of, of America. America is strong. You know, the problem is America doesn't have accountability for what it does. And when there is accountability, there is strength. There is no strength where there is no accountability. There is called chaos. There is chaos without accountability. And as long as we believe that this great country is fragile, we will continue to buy into a system that suggests only when white people go crazy, and excuse me, I don't mean it in in, in any kind of negative way, when white people go crazy, everything is weak. We've gone through too much to say we are fragile. We are very strong. These systems are strong. I've been trying to break them all my life. I know they are strong. They are mammoth. The problem is, do we have enough people that are ready to break them and remake them? That's the real question. I mean, it really comes down to us stop use, using language that says we can't change things. America can change anything it wants. When there's a major problem in America, when the automobile industry was getting ready to fail, we saved it. When things that matter are ready to fail, we save it. Black people just don't, they're not a priority. Brown people are not a priority. Immigrants that are brown are not a priority. And so whenever those issues come up, we're fragile. And we got to find somebody's truth. We know the truth. The truth is the light and the truth is the way. And we get mixed up when we, with the truth when we don't hold people accountable and we want the system to keep going as it is because it benefits us in some way. It benefits me in no way. The the best thing I can do is do everything I can to not get killed. That's that's my glory. My glory is survival. Every single day is about survival to me. When I go downtown DC, I can't get a taxi in 2021. So believe that. So when we say this country is fragile, I say you're wrong. This is the strongest democracy in the world, and it has been. We have strong institutions that have kept racism alive for 400 years. I call that strength. Uh, We have uh, come to many of the same conclusions that uh, everyone has spoken, and that, that is truth. And the whole question around what is truth, and truth is beyond mere definitions and terminology. Truth is a substantive principle that cannot be argued against. You can argue, you can exploit, you can manipulate facts, but you can't manipulate truth. Truth is a foundational principle that is completely cohesive uh, among all of human beings. And so what we came up with, what truth we came up with that just kept um raising up for us was the absolute truth of the golden rule 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So many of us are operating from a truth that is relativistic in nature and not absolute. Relative meaning that it is based on opinion and perspective. This is my lens and this is my truth. And therefore, my truth is not the same as your truth. So I can treat you like a non-human because black people are subhuman and non-human. That's my truth. And you need to respect my truth. But that's not absolute truth, because as we have said in our group, that the truth is we are all the Imago Dei. We are all created in the image and likeness of God. And so our beginning that of absolute truth is the golden rule that each of us needs to be treated in the way that we want to be treated. Now, how do we practically learn this abstract truth? or this, this truth that is that is higher level uh, in a transcendent way? What is the practical way of looking at truth? And the starting point is children. Because children, before they are indoctrinated by the false narratives of the world, start with a tabula rasa. And they have a clean slate. And the only way that it is imprinted by the hatred and bigotry, it comes from what they've taught. So in the word of America or in the context of America, America needs a rebirth, not the birth of a nation, but the rebirth of a nation and start with a new tabula rasa so that we can be imprinted with the truth that shall make us free. So D.W. Griffith, yeah, he came with the birth of a nation, but we need the rebirth of a nation, which is grounded in, in theological ideas in Christianity. That rebirth is what allows us to understand how we begin and start with truth so that when I see my neighbor, I see my neighbor as I see myself. I love my neighbor as I love myself, and I'm not going to create false doctrines about my neighbor so that I can continue to be superior or think that I'm superior to my neighbor, but we're all human. And that rebirth is the tabula rasa that allows us to begin to start with that point. It's, it's tough to want to leave tonight. Um, I, I will say that one of the many blessings of working at the ICJS is that I always get to learn from wonderful people like our panelists. And I, I know I can speak for all of my colleagues. We are very grateful for, for this gift that you've given us tonight um, and sharing. And I'll use truth with the capital T. We usually talk about personal truths, but I think we're, we're hitting on the bigger one. Um, and so thank you. Thank you all for, for your contributions tonight and for this wonderful event. Um, again, thank you so much. I wanna be cognizant of our time. Um, hopefully we will see you again soon. Sign up on our email list uh, to learn more about other events.